Hello and welcome back. This is the week 12 lecture. So today we're going to continue working on the research paper. By now we should have a pretty good amount of material. We've been developing claims over the last couple of weeks and then last week we talked a little bit more about a couple of sort of argumentative models or structures that you guys can use to kind of plug your claims into these larger structures to help you start planning body paragraphs. So we talked about the Tolman model, very simple argumentative structure that just features a claim, right? Some kind of debatable, uh, somewhat controversial statement followed by some type of reason and evidence uh, obviously the support that we need for the claim and then we have that warrant the underlying assumption or belief or value that we need to share with our audience in order for these claims and reasons and evidence to work so the Tolman model is very basic and I told you guys to just take some of the claims that you had already come up with uh, back in week 10 and just start plugging those claims into Tolman models. Just start replicating that structure. If you can do it a handful of times, you might have the plans now for a handful of body paragraphs. So once you sort of put a claim down, you just need to start thinking about what kind of evidence, what kind of support do I need in order for this claim to work. So you need to start thinking about your sources again. You might need to start going back into your sources and finding some of those inartistic appeals that you want to use in your body paragraphs. You need to start pairing up evidence with claims. You need to figure out which evidence goes with which claims, and that takes some time. You don't want to be scrambling to do that at the very last minute. You want to start doing that now. You want to do that as part of your planning process, part of your outlining. And that's really what this week is all about. Week 12 is all about outlining. Uh, hopefully by now we've already maybe started an outline or we've already started to work with some of our claims. So like I said, we have some material. Uh, we've been doing pre-writing. We have some ideas. We have some material, hopefully some claims and maybe even some evidence already down on paper. So now we really need to start focusing on body paragraphs. That's really the, the, the story for this week. We want to start planning as many bodies as we can. And the more claims we have, and the more we're able to pair those claims up with evidence, the more bodies we're going to be able to plan, and then eventually we can write those bodies, and we'll have enough material to do everything that we need to do in the research paper. So we're going to talk a little bit more today about body paragraphs, how to plan them, how to get ready to write them, and we're going to look at the specific body structure that I would like us to use, at least for the most part. Uh, it's at least a really good way to get started. Once you guys get really proficient and experienced with writing these body paragraphs, you might be able to start making some slight modifications to my structure. You might be able to depart from it a little bit in certain ways at certain times, but we want to start by mastering the structure, uh, getting really comfortable with it so we can start producing a lot of bodies. So that is our focus this week, but I also want to talk a little bit about the sample research paper that I posted. I think it's been in multiple modules by now. It might have even been available back in week 10. It was definitely available last week in the week 11 module, and it's also available this week in the week 12 module. So I want you guys to check out the sample paper, but you don't really need to read it word for word. You're not going to be tested on the content there. You don't need to become experts on the argument that the student is making, but I do want you guys to notice the structure, the length, and a few other things about that paper. So I'll just mention a few uh, items there. And then also before we sign off today, I do want to talk a little bit about the finished 
version of the annotated bibliography because, of course, that is due at the end of this week, at the end of week 12. So we need to be wrapping up our research this week if we haven't already. We need to make sure that we have all eight of our sources finalized and ready to go. So we'll talk a little bit about the bibliography at the end of lecture. But just a few things about the sample paper to start. If you guys want to open that up, again, it's available in the modules. I don't want you guys to feel like you have to read this paper from start to finish because, frankly, that's not necessary. I just want you to be able to see what a successful argumentative research paper looks like. So this is a real paper written by a real former 102 student of mine. I obviously had to remove the name uh, be, uh, due to privacy laws, but uh, the student was in my 102 class several semesters ago. It's been a while now. But the assignment they were tackling is the exact same assignment that you guys are working on now. So the reason I like to use this paper uh, is because it is a success successful, effective research paper, but it's also not perfect. I feel like when students see this paper, uh, it feels attainable. It feels achievable because the paper is not beyond any of you. I mean, it's good, it's successful, but there are a few errors. I mean, there are a few areas uh, that could be improved. Like I said, it's not perfect. Uh, you know, it's it's very human. It's it's very relatable. It's good, but not, but imperfect. There are a few things that we can, you know, a few errors we could pick out and a few things she could have probably added to the paper. Paper, but ultimately, it is a successful argument. And I want you guys to look at the scale and the scope of the paper. I want you to see how she uses evidence, uh, how she integrates the evidence into her body paragraphs. Not all of her bodies are super detailed and well-developed, but most of them are. And she's able to sustain and develop her argument over the course of the body. So if you're looking through that paper, you'll notice that I've labeled the four major sections of the research paper. We've already talked about those four sections, but I've labeled them for you so you can see the facts that she kind of leads with in the intro paragraph. I've labeled those. She doesn't have a ton, but she does establish some basic parameters of the debate that she is entering. So she is pretty good about that. She, she establishes the argument that's going on around her topic, which is genetic engineering. Um, and she establishes some basic facts about the debate, about what people say uh, about genetic engineering and why a lot of people are opposed to it. So she establishes facts and then you'll notice that she has a bit of a definition paragraph after the intro paragraph where she's giving more detail and explanation about the ongoing controversy surrounding her topic and the reason, again, so many people are opposed to it. So she has some definition, then she gets into her body paragraphs where she really begins to develop the argument. So you'll notice that there are a lot of bodies uh, she covers a lot of sources. She develops a lot of claims. I've tried to label her topic sentences at the start of those body paragraphs so you can see how, for the most part, uh, she is announcing what she's going to be doing in each paragraph. And she develops those paragraphs with original points, you know, claims, ideas of her own. But then she's also bringing in evidence from sources. Uh, she uses sources pretty well. Doesn't do a ton of synthesis, but you will notice in some of those body paragraphs, we are talking about multiple sources. It's not one source per body. 
At times, she's she's integrating two different sources into the same body. She's not always necessarily talking about them together, but they do coexist in the same bodies. They might be working towards the same supporting claim. So for the most part, we see the structure present that we've been talking about. Each one of her body paragraphs is accomplishing some goal. It's developing a supporting claim or point of some kind. And she's normally offering a lot of evidence in those bodies. So, you know, look at the length of the paper, look at the organization. And again, notice my labels. You obviously don't need to include those labels in your own paper. I'm simply putting them in the sample paper so you can see the layout. So you can see all four of those major sections that we talked about. So you can go through the bodies. That's where the argument's really getting made. And then she does have a a little bit about policy uh, towards the very end near the conclusion. So the policy is the fourth and final section. Like we've said, that's your recommendation, your solution, the course of action that needs to be taken, all of that. She provides a lot of those details in her concluding paragraph. She's been talking a little bit about policy throughout, so she doesn't really have an extended policy section at the end. Some some students will have sort of a standalone policy section at the end of their bodies that might uh, take up the last couple of body paragraphs, but she's really not necessarily doing that. Most of her policy, I think, if my memory serves, uh, is mostly kind of uh, put into the conclusion. Um, But you guys have some options there. It depends how much time you want to spend developing all the details of your policy. Like I've said, some people are talking about their policy throughout their bodies because their argument really is policy-based. So a lot of the claims that are getting developed in the bodies are going to be at least somewhat about the policy. But in other cases, we don't talk about the policy really until the end, in which case we might want to devote one or two body paragraphs just to policy. We'll have plenty of time to make those decisions. But another thing you should notice near the end of her bodies is she offers a rebuttal to her opponents. And that's a really good thing to do. I think we, you know, a lot of you really need to do that when possible uh, in your bodies. It's just a nice strategy because it enhances your ethos. It really does enhance your credibility. It makes you look like you have listened to your opponents. You have read their work. You have listened to the work they've done. You have uh, accurately captured or understood their argument and now you can respond to it now you can tell them why they're wrong or you can attempt to find some kind of middle ground if you want to use the rogerian argumentative style that we mentioned last week which is more focused on compromise finding middle ground common ground with your opponent so you can do whatever but offering some kind of a rebuttal is always a good idea because you show that you've done your homework, you've done the reading, you know what your opponents have to say, you've considered their argument, you've taken it under consideration, and now you're prepared to respond to it. So it just makes you look good, it makes you look prepared, knowledgeable, and it makes your argument seem stronger because you have a direct response for what the other side says. If you never do that, if you never rebut your opponents, it looks like maybe you haven't listened to your opponents, maybe you don't have a great handle on what your opponents are saying, or maybe you just don't really care, maybe you're just so focused on your own thoughts, you're not really listening to the other side, and sometimes that can hurt your credibility and make you seem to certain audience members, it might make you seem a little less trustworthy. Uh, So just a a nice thing to try to plan for. As we start planning our bodies, you might want to spend one body or a couple uh, like she does offering some rebuttals to 
per opponent. So as you're going through that sample paper, just look at my labels, kind of track all of the major sections that we've talked about so you see how everything looks, how everything is arranged. Again, her organization is pretty good. Uh, you might notice a few minor errors, a few minor citation errors. It would be good if you could notice those. I won't give them away. If you notice them, that means you know the rules. And that's a good sign. Uh, but again, the paper's not perfect, but it's good. The argument works. It's pretty well developed. Good use of sources. And that's something that we can all do. We can all match the level of that paper because it's good, but it's not unattainable. It's not out of this world. It's just good, solid work done by somebody who had done good research, had a good handle on the topic, and developed an original argument. So just a reminder, guys, it really is time to get argumentative if you haven't been already. So hopefully when you got the proposal in by the end of last week, you were, you know, you were feeling pretty good about your argument. You don't have to have the thesis statement totally worked out yet, but you need to know or at least have a general idea about the argument that you want to make. What is your position? What is your argument? What is your original contribution? So that's very important. Up until now, we've been more focused on other people's arguments, you know, the arguments getting made in our sources, but now the focus is our argument. So I've kind of mentioned this before, but I want to say it again today because it's really important when we start thinking about the structure of our body paragraphs. The focus is now on your argument. You and your argument are the featured attraction of this research paper. You are the star performer and your sources are supporting characters. They are supporting actors. They are there to support you and your ideas, but you're the featured attraction. You, the writer, that means your argument takes center stage. So you just really need to be thinking about your overall argument, obviously the thesis, and then a bunch of these supporting claims that are going to go along with that thesis. Because like we've been saying, you're going to be walking us through those supporting claims in the majority of your body paragraphs. So you need to start really focusing on your argument, your ideas, your points. You can't simply rely on the arguments of your sources. Even if they often agree with you, that's fine. You're obviously using them for support, but you have to have original things to say. <laughs> you need to make sure that you're making an original contribution. And that's a, a, a real challenge on this assignment. And it's a problem I see some students run into every semester in 102. Because we have so many sources, because we're, you know, we've learned so much about our topic uh, and we've done so much reading and research, it can be really easy to get overwhelmed by your sources. If you're not careful, you can end up doing something very much like the rhetorical analysis where you're just summarizing, paraphrasing, and quoting your sources. And you don't really have an argument of your own. You're just recycling the arguments of your sources. That was fine on the rhetorical analysis, but it's not going to be good for the research paper. So remember, put yourself front and center. The sources are there to serve you. So even if you're making an argument that in many ways is similar to what a lot of your sources are saying, you still need to find a way to make this particular argument yours. You have to put your own spin on it. Find your own angle, your own way of expressing it, your own way of explaining it, uh, your own take. Uh, it's got to be somewhat unique and original and that can be difficult sometimes when you've done a lot of research and you are in agreement with a lot of your sources but that is part of our mission here uh, but our body paragraph structure is going to help us with this because if you follow the structure you're going to be able to achieve a nice balance in your bodies between your own original ideas and claims and the support that you're bringing in from your sources 
And that's the whole idea. We want a balance. Obviously, we don't want a bunch of claims and opinions of ours just floating around with no support because that's not very effective. But at the same time, we don't want to spend all of our time just regurgitating our sources because that's not what the assignment calls for either. So we need to strike the balance. So if you look at the body paragraph uh, sort of format that I've put in the module, I think it was in the week 11 overview. It's also in the week 12 overview. You'll see what I mean about this balance. It's kind of a layered approach uh, where we're going to start by doing one thing and then we have the next layer and then the layer under that and we keep going. That's how we're going to build uh, our paragraphs. We really should think about this like construction. We are building something. Uh, when we put together a paper, we're building each individual paragraph. They're like, you know, parts of a house or, you know, furniture. They're part of the overall construction project. And too often, we don't think enough about paragraphs. We don't think enough about body paragraphs in particular. Uh, often when we're writing, the paragraphs just kind of happen, right? We're writing, 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 and then every once in a while we'll, we'll realize that we have a super long paragraph, so we'll break it and start a new paragraph, and then we're just, okay, writing, 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 and then we'll do that a few other times, and we just kind of get these random paragraph breaks because we don't want to have super long paragraphs, and we just end up with kind of a random assortment of body paragraphs, maybe one long one, couple of short ones. They're all kind of different. Uh, different stuff is happening within a bunch of these paragraphs. They're not always unified or consistent, and we're not always really thinking much about them. We tend to think about our intro paragraph because we know that almost always we have to do certain things in our intro paragraph. We have to introduce our topic, our subjects. We have to establish a thesis. We, we generally know that. And then the concluding paragraph, we restate the thesis. We know that. We sum everything up. So we kind of know uh, going in how the intro is going to be and how the conclusion is going to be. But often we don't think very much about body paragraphs. And that can be a problem because obviously with a paper of this length, as we can see in the sample paper, we need a lot of bodies. We spend most of our time writing Body. So like I was saying all the way back in week 10, that's why we need so many claims so we can develop a lot of good bodies. So the first step in our body structure is to write that topic sentence. Announce what the paragraph is going to be about. What supporting claim are we going to be talking about in this particular paragraph? So again, I tried to label uh, the topic sentences in the sample paper. They're not all stellar. But for the most part, the student does introduce what the paragraph is going to be about. That's all we're doing. We're not reinventing the wheel, but it's nice to come up with some fun, catchy, interesting topic sentences. Uh, remember, part of your goal here is to grab the interest and the attention of your readers. So you don't want your topic sentences to be boring and bland because then your readers aren't going to be super excited about reading the rest of that paragraph. So uh, sometimes you can pose provocative questions. Sometimes you can sort of paint a picture in the reader's mind. A lot of the same strategies that we use for the opening hook. That's kind of like your first topic sentence, right? The opening sentence of your intro paragraph. We often call that the hook because you're trying to hook readers, grab their interest, make them want to read more. So that same basic idea kind of holds for all the topic sentences that you write because you're kind of doing that at the beginning of every paragraph. You're trying to grab the interest of the reader once again. You're trying to sustain interest, maintain interest. Uh, with the, you know each paragraph. So um, start working on those topic sentences. Again, start taking some of the claims that you know you're going to use and basically just try to announce 
those claims in a clear yet interesting way. So you don't want to confuse us. You, you can't get into all the details yet. Topic sentences are typically going to be broad and somewhat general. Okay, so don't overload them with too much stuff. They tend to be pretty straightforward, but they also need to be somewhat interesting and enticing. So start developing them. Just basically take the claims and then write new sentences where you're introducing or announcing that claim. And that might be a topic sentence. So once you've announced what the paragraph is going to be about, the next step is to follow up on that topic sentence with some additional detail or a little bit of additional explanation. Again, the topic sentence will typically be broad, general, uh, kind of an overview. It's, you don't have a lot of room for specifics and detail. That's why you want the follow-up. Uh, a sentence or two right after the topic sentence where you can get into this supporting claim, the topic of the paragraph, in a little bit more detail. You can start to paint a more clear picture, maybe offer an example, or maybe offer some more details, a little bit more description. Uh, maybe you're just explaining, putting things in easier language uh, for your readers to be able to understand. Again, this doesn't typically take long. It's a one or two sentence follow-up, but mostly you're just getting more specific, more focused, on whatever it is this paragraph is going to be about. Uh, and typically, as part of that follow-up, you're going to make a claim. You're going to establish an original claim of your own. Okay, And then that sets the stage for the third part, the next layer, which is some kind of evidence from, usually, from sources some kind of inartistic appeal that you can bring in to support the claim that you've offered as part of that follow-up, or maybe it comes immediately after the follow-up. But once you've introduced the claim that we're getting into, and you've offered the specifics, you've offered uh, a little more, more detail, then it's time to really develop that claim. So either restate it, return to it, and then offer evidence, offer the reasons and the evidence needed to support it. So that that's the Tolman model, right? It, it basically, we're not, we're not replicating it exactly, but uh, you're using all those core components that we talked about last week, the claim, the reason, the evidence. So again, the claim gets announced, but generally, at the beginning of the paragraph. Then there's a little more detail, a little more specifics. You might want to restate that claim or you might want to clarify that claim or, uh, you know, do something else with it. And then we get to reasons. Then we get to evidence. So at that point, at that third level, okay, after the follow up, that next level, it's really time to import your Tolman model, all of the stuff from your Tolman model. So a reason that can be in your own language, your own sentence, and then evidence, which will typically come from sources. So at this point, we're starting to import material from our sources. Uh, so find the statistics that you wanna use right here to support this particular claim. Find uh, the testimonials, find some additional examples, maybe an extended example. Decide what exactly you wanna do. Do you wanna briefly summarize something from a source? Maybe spend a couple of sentences doing a brief summary. Do you wanna do a briefer paraphrase, a shorter paraphrase, maybe just a single sentence where you're taking a really important idea and just putting it into your own words? Uh, or do you want to provide a direct quote? Make sure you're providing the correct in-text citation. Uh, and then once you've brought that evidence in, whether it's in the form of a quote, summary, or paraphrase, obviously cite it and then you follow up on it. So just like we follow up on the topic sentence, we have to follow up on the evidence that we provide because evidence cannot always speak for itself. 
So oftentimes you're going to need to explain something about that evidence. You're going to have to maybe clarify something, offer additional detail or examples. And then in other cases, like we've said before, if you don't think the evidence really demands further explanation, if you think it's pretty self-explanatory, then you just have to do something with it. You have to make that evidence work for you. So it's obviously going along with that claim. Uh, so you have the Tolman model pretty much uh, where you need it, but now we have to make our next move. You have to do something with the claim and the reason and the evidence. You can't just put it there and then immediately move on from it and forget about it. You have to use it to your benefit. So again, it's always nice to be able to tie this supporting claim back to the overall thesis, make that explicit, make that connection clear before wrapping up the paragraph. And then also you can use what you just gave us. Um, you know, that, that evidence that you just gave us, you can use it to help you transition into your next move, your next claim or point, your next paragraph, but use it for something. Do something with it. Uh, very often I see in research papers a lot of good evidence, a lot of good source material that students have dropped into paragraphs and then done virtually nothing with. They just drop the quote in there or they drop the summary in there and they don't comment on it. They don't talk about it. They don't, they don't follow up on it. They don't use it directly for anything. They just move on to the next thing, the next paragraph. And a lot of times that's just not enough. I'm not seeing enough development and I don't always know exactly how the claim and the evidence that they were just talking about, I don't always know exactly how it ties in to our larger thesis and our larger purpose. It's not always clear. So that's why you need some kind of follow up after uh, the evidence, no matter what form that evidence takes. Now let's talk about it. Let's do something with it. Let's use it to pivot to our next thing, or we might want to keep going in this same vein. So you'll notice in my, in my structure, my model, I'm telling you that after that initial follow-up to the evidence, you could potentially end the paragraph there. Not all bodies are going to be the same length. Some will be longer than others. So if this is a body that's a little more on the short side, uh, you might conclude the, the paragraph, you might wrap it up after providing that follow-up to the evidence. But you could also continue. You can also keep going by perhaps introducing another related claim or maybe it's another aspect or another facet of the claim that we announced back at the beginning of the paragraph. Maybe we're just getting into another part of it, another aspect of it. Uh, maybe there's a very similar related claim that goes right along with it. Maybe there's some kind of easy cause and effect that we're tracking whatever, if maybe there's just more to say about that claim. You want to come back on the other side of that evidence and just keep going. So your follow-up can be very extended and it can lead to some other thing that you want to get into, some other uh, strategies or methods of development that you want to use. I think I mentioned some of these before, but just a few things to do as we're building our paragraphs, we can conduct comparisons, you know, we can look at cause and effect, uh, we can provide additional definitions, we can classify. These are all just basic rhetorical strategies, strategies that people use to make arguments, you know, compare, contrast, <laughs> cause and effect, definition, classification, description. We can describe things. We can even use aspects of narrative, especially if we're sharing extended examples, those anecdotes that take the form of narrative with little plots and characters, uh, themes even. Uh, and even if we're using some personal experience, sometimes we can present that in narrative form. So, you know, we can get into any of that stuff in our bodies. We can start comparing. We can do a little description, a little narrative, uh, get in more to cause and effect, but just decide 
what you want to do after you followed up on the evidence. Is there more to say about the claim being discussed in this paragraph? Or have you pretty much done everything you need to do? You, you had the claim, you had your reasons, you presented evidence, you said a little bit more about the evidence, now you're ready to move on to the next body. Just make a decision, but it's nice to have a balance when it comes to paragraph length as well. We don't want all of our bodies to be super long. That can be a little difficult on readers uh, at times. And the general rule of thumb in terms of body paragraph length is we don't really want any single body to be longer than one full page in a Microsoft Word document that's double spaced, as of, sh as of course it should be. So we don't want our bodies to stretch beyond a full page, but we also don't want all of our bodies to be really short. Because if they're really short, that often means they're not really well developed, they're not detailed, they're not thorough. So we want some long ones that might be close to a page, and then some shorter ones that might you know, just be like a quarter of a page or something, that's fine. It's nice to have a balance. The same goes with sentence structure. You know, We don't wanna read long sentence after long sentence after long sentence because that becomes difficult and a little bit tiring, but we're not children, so we don't want to read short, simple sentence after short, simple sentence either because that becomes repetitive and boring. So you want to strike a balance between short and long. So with some bodies, keep going after you follow up on the initial evidence and do more with that body. But then in other cases, if you want to keep the body relatively short, you can wrap it up and move on to the next. So once you guys get the hang of this basic kind of layered, balanced structure, your bodies will start taking shape and they'll be effective. You'll be able to have well-developed bodies that are actually doing things. And that's really important to remember. Your Each body paragraph that you write needs to accomplish something. It needs to accomplish some goal. It needs to make, it needs to, you know, develop a particular claim. It needs to make a claim uh, of yours seem believable, convincing, likely, possible. Uh, you need to make sure that each body is doing something for you. And like I said, when I see a lot of times in these papers, I see paragraphs that just seem random, like they're just a random collection of thoughts and disconnected ideas. And there's no unity. There's no consistency. So we want to make sure that our body paragraphs are unified. That means what we start out talking about is pretty much what we finish talking about at the end of the paragraph. We're sticking with that supporting claim or we're, we're sticking with two related supporting claims or we're sticking with one basic idea from the start of the paragraph until the end. Even if it's a long body, we might be doing a lot of different things with that claim, developing it, following it uh, through a lot of different steps, but uh, the paragraph remains unified because it's accomplishing a clear goal. It's advancing a clear supporting claim. It's presenting evidence to support that claim. And uh, where we end up is pretty similar to where we started. So that's going to be good for your readers. That helps us stay oriented. That helps us to stay organized. We're able to follow your argument. Each paragraph is adding another brick, another part of the larger structure. Uh, so we can follow the progression. We can follow all of these different supporting claims. Uh, and as they all get developed over the course of your bodies, you're building an argument. You're building an argument that can actually hold up and do things. So that's always our goal. And when we go back later and we do our reverse outline and we're sort of double checking all of our paragraphs, that's what we're going to be looking for. We're going to ask, hey, is this paragraph doing something? Is it advancing one of my supporting claims? Is it helping my overall argument? And if the answer is no, we need to keep working on it. So uh, just try that structure on for size, like just take some of the claims and some of the evidence that you've already come up with, maybe that you've already plugged into one of our Tolman models, just take some of that stuff and start putting it 
into this body paragraph format. So start with the topic sentence, follow up on the topic sentence, and then sort of restate or get into that claim uh, more, offer the reasons, offer the evidence, follow up on the evidence, and then decide if you want to keep going or end the paragraph there. But also think about transitions. You know, we have to transition from one body paragraph to the next. So sometimes our topic sentences can help us transition. Other times the way we end paragraphs can help us transition. So the way we draw a paragraph to a close can serve as a bridge or a transition to the topic sentence of our next paragraph. Another thing to remember is that some of your supporting claims are going to be so big and so important, it might take multiple body paragraphs to cover them. And that's fine. Don't feel like you have to cram everything that you're going to say about the supporting claim into just one body. If it's a relatively short, sweet, simple claim, then yeah, one body will probably suffice. But if it's a very complex claim with a lot of different elements or aspects or levels, you might need to devote two bodies to it or three bodies. And it's pretty easy to transition in that case because you're sticking with the same supporting claim for an extended period of time. So once you guys start writing and drafting, you're often going to get into the groove, you're going to get, you know, going to get into a good writing rhythm and you'll end up uh, churning out a really long paragraph typically about a supporting claim that you have much to say about and you have to at some point probably break that long paragraph uh, and make it into two separate paragraphs. But that usually works pretty well because you're discussing the same general stuff in both of those paragraphs. So one kind of will naturally lead into the next and then you can wrap up that claim before moving on to your next supporting claim. So just keep that in mind as you start planning. But our goal for this week should be to try to plan somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to ten body paragraphs. That's a good number. Uh, you don't have to necessarily fall within that range, but that's a good sort of average place to be for a paper of this length. Most of these successful research papers are going to have somewhere in that general neighborhood of eight to 10 bodies. Uh, that might include a policy paragraph. That might include a couple of rebuttal paragraphs where you are directly responding to your opponents, like we were saying. Uh, so I've also included the definition paragraph structure and the basic structure for the intro paragraph and, of course, the concluding paragraph. Those are all pretty straightforward, pretty easy to plan, but you can start working on those as well. So please find time during this week to outline. Your outline doesn't have to look exactly like mine. My sample outline is posted in the module, but I just want you to start creating an outline of your own using mine to guide you, of course, but you can choose your own format, your own style. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're doing it on the computer or by hand, but you need an outline and you need it to be mostly finished by the end of this week. Because remember, at the end of this week, obviously, you're submitting bibliographies. You need to be pretty far along on the outline. And then next week, we have video conferences. So in week 13, we're not going to have a lecture. We're not going to have a regular week of class. Instead, you guys will be meeting with me individually for video conferences throughout the week. And I'll have a schedule posted soon so you can see your time. If that time does not work for you, you can email me and we can try to work something out. So when you come to your conference, you need to have the outline in hand. Uh, and it would be great if you did have it uh, in a Word doc or a PDF by that point, because then you'll be able to upload that document during our video conference and we can both look at it. 
so I can take a look at what you have. I can see your plan, see where you're going, and we can talk about what you need to do next. Obviously, if you have questions, you can ask me, and we can basically just talk about your paper, talk about where you are, and what you still need to do. So, uh, yeah, just work on those outlines and try to have them pretty much finished by the end of the week so you can bring them to the conference. And then once you have a good outline and once we conference and talk a little bit more about your paper, you're ready to start drafting. So next week in week 13, you should be able to start working on a rough draft. But we're not quite there yet. Uh, For now, the focus is outlining and obviously our bibliographies. So just a reminder, uh, make sure to get your finished bib in by the end of the week. Nothing is changing as far as our formatting, the basic structure of the document. None of that is changing from the first half. Remember, we did the first half. Uh, Just go back. You might want to look at that old file, look at my instructions, look at my examples. We're still providing correct works cited citations, followed by our annotations, which consist of brief summaries and evaluations of each source. Uh, So follow the same format uh, that you did last time. And if you had some issues with formatting or with your citations, anything, uh, if your citations were wrong, if your document wasn't formatted correctly, go back and read my corrections, my comments on the first half. Because I told you what was wrong and I told you most likely how to fix it. So make the necessary adjustments and obviously add four additional sources. If you are sticking with the four sources that appeared on the first half of the bibliography, then those four sources can also appear on the final version. But obviously you need four additional sources that I have not seen yet. But conversely, if you've decided you're not going to stick with one or two of those sources that was on the original bib, that's okay. You can sub them out for new sources, but you're just going to have additional new sources on the finished bib. The, the, you know, the total number is still eight. But if two of the originals aren't good anymore for you, then obviously... Uh, you need to replace them with new sources, sources that you are planning to use on the research paper. And just keep that in mind. All eight of these sources that will appear on your bibliography, all eight of them need to also appear in your research paper. So you might need to make some final decisions this week if you're still on the fence about a particular source, you're not sure if you're going to use it or not. You need to decide. And if you guys have nine or ten sources on the bib, that's fine. I don't mind. Um, And you can, you know, use all nine or ten of those on the paper. I really don't want more than ten. That's just too many. And obviously you don't want less than eight because then you're not meeting the minimum requirement. And remember, out of the eight that are required, two of them, two of the eight need to be academic peer-reviewed sources. So that usually means scholarly articles from academic journals. Okay, it could also be a book written by scholars or experts. Uh, But two of your eight sources need to be scholarly, academic, and peer-reviewed. And if you guys aren't sure what any of that means, you can talk to me, email me. Um, But... I I talked about it weeks ago when we first started our research, so you might want to revisit that lecture as well. But I don't mind popular sources. I don't mind a couple of websites. But you need to include some scholarly sources, and please don't have all eight of your sources be websites, okay? (laughs) Let's make sure we're using articles and books first and foremost. Websites can be okay, but they're not as good typically as those other sources. And I don't mind newspaper and magazine articles, but let's also use at least a couple of academic journal articles because they are excellent sources. So if you guys have any questions about the bibliographies, just let me know. And after those bibs come in, at the end of this week, we won't have any other assignments except for the research paper. 
So get in touch with me if you need anything and look for that schedule. It's going to be posted early in week 12, no later than Tuesday. All right, so check the schedule, see uh, your conference time for week 13, and then get in touch with me if you need a new time. If you need to reschedule, let's talk. Otherwise, uh, I will send you the link closer to time. I'm going to send all the conference links through email. It's very simple. We're using Cranium Cafe through Canvas. So I'm going to send you a link. You click on that link. It takes you to the conference. I'll be there and we'll talk. Okay. These are helpful and they're short. They're painless. We don't have to talk about anything but the research paper and I keep them around 10 minutes only. So Try to make it. Let me know if you need a new time and bring your outline when you come to your conference. Okay, I'll see you soon.